Meanwhile, coming back to the Khalistani attacks, they're very much on. Yesterday, there was another round of protests in London. Some 2,000 Khalistan supporters turned up at the Indian High Commission, also called the India House. And this protest lasted for almost three hours. There were tense moments. Protesters turned aggressive and violent. They threw water bottles and some flares. But this time, there was more security presence. Scotland Yard had blockaded the area around and outside India House. Additional cops were deployed, including some on horseback. The UK Foreign Secretary said the Metropolitan Police is reviewing security at the Indian High Commission. And this comes right after India's tit-for-tat move. We told you about it yesterday. India has downgraded security at the British High Commission. This is in New Delhi. Additional security bar barricades outside the British High Commission have been removed. So London got a taste of its own medicine. It promises to ensure the safety of Indians, but local politics gets the better of them. Two British Sikh MPs have been fanning tensions, apparently. These are Tanmanjit Singh and Preet Kaur Gill, both from the Labour Party, the opposition party in the UK right now. They've been accused of exaggerating the events in Punjab and raising concerns about the safety of Sikhs. This is about the police action against Amritpal Singh. He is the latest figurehead of the Khalistan movement. He is linked to Pakistan. He is armed and dangerous. And he is on the run in India. The police have launched a manhunt. The Indian High Commissioner in London tried to set the record straight for Sikhs in the UK. Let me assure all our friends here in the UK, especially brothers and sisters with relatives in Punjab, that there is no truth to sensationalist lies being circulated on social media. The situation in your ancestral homeland is not what it is being reported. The elected chief minister of the state and the local police authorities have put out detailed information, including interviews on television. Please watch these. Do not believe the small handful of people putting out fiction and disinformation. But tensions persist. Sooner or later, Amritpal will be captured. When that happens, the Khalistani supporters could up the ante again. They've always been violent secessionists. They take the law into their hands. And if they do it again, broken windows will be the last of India's problems. There's a security threat to Indian diplomatic staff and possibly to ordinary Indians based overseas as well. Today, there was another protest in San Francisco in the U.S. Khalistanis turned up at the Indian mission with flags. Thankfully, no violence has been reported so far. This is the second such protest in four days here. The last time they came, they chased the staff, broke windows and vandalized the building. So India asked for additional security and the U.S. heeded the Indian request. In fact, the Indian Consul General met with the local police earlier today. The consulate was barricaded. The San Francisco police were standing guard. And all of this is welcome, but it won't be enough. One, because this came after the attack. And two, they're still not going after the Khalistanis, their terror network and their funding. India must keep up the diplomatic pressure, push for more security of its diplomats and more accountability from Western governments on harboring anti-India groups. And now a story from Jammu and Kashmir, a story of India reclaiming its heritage and traditions. India lost a lot during the partition. Today we'll talk about what the native residents of Kashmir, the Kashmiri pundits, lost. They lost the Sharda Shakti Peet, which now lies in ruins in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. This was once a magnificent site of worship and learning. And this wasn't just a loss for Kashmiri pundits. This was a big loss for India's civilization. The pundits have had a long-standing demand. They've been asking for access to the Sharda Peet in POK. Repeated requests have fallen on deaf ears. But now there's a glimmer of hope. The government of India is looking to open a Kartarpur-like corridor to connect the Sharda Peet in POK with Kashmir. But this comes with a host of challenges. Also an opportunity for both India and Pakistan. Our next report tells you more. This is the Sharda Shakti Peet a 5,000-year-old temple, one of the most important sites of pilgrimage for Kashmiri pundits. Today, it lies in ruins, barely 10 kilometers from the line of control between India and Pakistan. Until 1947, an annual pilgrimage was organized to the temple. Then, partition happened. Indians lost access to this seat of knowledge, and no earnest attempt was made to revive the pilgrimage. All of that may change now. This week, a temple dedicated to the goddess Sharda was inaugurated by India's Home Minister, Amit Shah. 
It's located on the banks of the Kishan Ganga River in Kashmir's Kupwara district. India is also working on a pilgrimage corridor, one that connects Indian Kashmir with Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. The Home Minister said the government is committed to this and that the new temple is the beginning of an era, a step towards the rediscovery of the Sharda civilization and the Sharda script. The temple in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir is dedicated to the goddess Saraswati, the Hindu goddess of learning and knowledge. Near the temple are the ruins of one of the world's oldest universities. They're believed to have had their own script called Sharda, more than 5,000 scholars and the biggest library of their times. It ranked among ancient learning centers like Takshila and Nalanda, and now some of its lost glory may be revived. India is planning to build a passage along the lines of the Kartarpur Corridor. The Kartarpur Corridor connects Gurdwara Dera Baba Nanak in India to Gurdwara Darbar Sahib in Pakistan. It was the final resting place of Guru Nanak, the founder of the Sikh. These two centers of pilgrimage in India and Pakistan are linked by a corridor. Devotees no longer have to apply for a visa to visit the shrine in Pakistan. New Delhi wants a similar corridor for Sharda Peet in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. This has been a long-standing demand of Kashmiri Pandits. As of today, visitors and pilgrims need an NOC or No Objection Certificate. And even that is no guarantee of access. Many devotees are routinely turned away by the Pakistani side. A corridor would help, but building it won't be easy. It will involve engaging with Pakistan. And while Kartarpur was in Punjab, this is Kashmir we're talking about. The line of control in Kashmir tends to be volatile. And unlike Kartarpur Sahib, which is just about 4.7 kilometers from the border, the Sharda Peet is 10 kilometers away from the LOC. So a corridor linking Sharda Peet with Indian Kashmir will require double the manning that the Kartarpur corridor does. Also, Pakistan is unlikely to agree to such a corridor without getting something in return. If you didn't already know, only Indian devotees can travel to Gurdwara Darbar Sahib in Pakistan without a visa. The corridor does not allow Pakistanis to travel to Dera Baba Nanak in India. With Sharda Peet, Pakistan is likely to push for its own citizens to be allowed entry into India to visit the Hazrat Bal Shrine in Srinagar. An influx of Pakistani tourists could pose a major security risk for India. So, a lot depends on whether India can clinch a Kartarpur-like deal with Pakistan. Now let's talk about another bank, the World Bank. It is set to get a new president. Until recently, it was supposed to be a person of Indian origin nominated by the US president. But now China has come in the way. China says it could support someone else. Tonight, we'll discuss why. Why China has reservations about this and how it installs Chinese nationals to lead top global institutions. Does it bring leverage? Sure it does. Does India use this leverage with Indian origin leaders of global institutions? We're not so sure. This story begins with Ajay Banga, 63 years old, former CEO of MasterCard, and now the front runner for the post of World Bank, World Bank chief. Until a few days back, it was a foregone conclusion. US President Biden had nominated him. His CV is rock solid. He led MasterCard for 12 years before retiring in 2021. He's also a champion of sustainable growth. Listen to what he said during a recent trip to Kenya. My belief is that the going forward economy and growth cannot and should not be conducted in the same emissions heavy way of the prior 30 years. We cannot afford it. Our children cannot afford it. So Banga was the perfect fit to lead the World Bank. But now the world is not so sure, because China has entered the picture. China says it is, quote unquote, open to supporting other potential candidates based on merit, meaning it could back someone else. But why is China not keen on Ajay Banga? To answer that, we must understand World Bank politics. The World Bank is a shining example of US hegemony. It has always been headed by an American. Its president is technically chosen by 25 executive directors, but the process is opaque. And for some reason, an American always comes out as president. In that sense, Ajay Banga would not have been an exception. He's of Indian origin, but he's now an American. And China seems to be opposing that. 
So is this really a case of China pushing for a fair and open system? Far from it. This is proof of China's worsening relationship with the U.S. And talking about merit is a politically correct way of opposing the U.S. Also, Banga's nomination has not been without controversy. Germany, in particular, wanted a woman to head the World Bank. The institution has been around for 77 years. It has never had a woman president or a president of color. Only white American men. So calls for diversity and inclusion, which are both ad admirable goals, could be weaponized by Beijing. It could be a way to wrest control of the World Bank from the U.S., because Beijing knows the value of having its people in charge. And China has been at it for years now. It has installed Chinese nationals at the helm of UN bodies. The list includes the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the International Civil Aviation Organization, the International Telecommunication Union, the Industrial Development Organization. They've all been led by Chinese citizens. Even the World Health Organization, it was led by Hong Kong's Margaret Chan. And China uses these appointments to push its agenda. If it's aiming for the World Bank next, Ajay Banga could be collateral damage. So now he's trying to rally support. He's traveling the world. He began the campaign with Africa. And now he's in India. He's meeting Prime Minister Narendra Modi and External Affairs Minister S.J. Shankar. India has, of course, already backed Banga. He's in New Delhi to get a better idea of India's requirements from the World Bank. But the Indian capital is decked up as if to welcome a returning war hero. Which brings us to the other side of the story. You see, India always celebrates when its people do well abroad. Even if they've renounced Indian citizenship. India does not allow dual citizenship. It is one of about 50 countries that do not allow dual citizenship. And so even if these achievers are not Indian anymore, they're still considered sons of the soil. And to be fair, they've done well for themselves. We only wish them the best. But our question is this. Has India managed to leverage its people attaining high positions abroad? Remember when Rishi Sunak became the UK Prime Minister, Indians were thumping their chests, saying that the Raj has struck back, that now an Indian was the Viceroy in London. Well, that Indian Viceroy has done little to protect Indian interests. A High Commission came under attack. The Khalistanis are running riot. How did Rishi Sunak's prime ministership help India? The UK's vote bank politics trumped the Indian connection. And by the way, here's an interesting contrast. London has a Pakistan origin mayor. His name is Sadiq Khan. And under him, Ramzan lights were switched on in Piccadilly Circus for the first time ever. It has never happened before. Again, nothing wrong with having Ramzan lights in Piccadilly Circus. But here's a question that must be considered. As India backs Ajay Banga and cheers for the likes of Sundar Pichai, Satya Nadella, Indra Nui and Parag Agarwala, how does India benefit from their rise? Do they create more jobs in India? Do they push for policies favorable to India? If not, then why the ridiculous displays of pride? India needs to do more on the global stage. India needs to push forth its own citizens. Push for Indian nationals who have some skin in the game. And this may be one area where India can learn from its notorious northern neighbor.